Okay, welcome back everyone. CUBE's coverage of Remars here in Las Vegas in person. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. This is the analyst panel wrap up analysis of the keynote, the show, past one and a half days. We've got two great guests here. We've got Andy Thrive, Vice President, Principal Consultant at Constellation Research. Larry Carvello, Principal Consultant at Robust Cloud LLC. Congratulations, going out on your own. Thank you. Um, Andy, great to see you. Great to see you Guys, well. thanks for coming out. So this is the, this is the session where we kind of break down and analyze. You guys are analysts, uh, industry analysts. Um, you go to all the shows, we see each other. You guys are analyzing the landscape. What does this show mean to you guys? Because this is not obvious to the normal tech follower. The insiders kind of see the confluence of robotics, space, automation, and machine learning. Obviously it's IOT, it's industrial, it's a bunch of things. But there's some dots to connect. Let's start with you, Larry. What do you see here happening at this show? So you, you got to see how um, Amazon started, right? When, when AWS started. When AWS started, it primarily took the compute storage networking of Amazon.com and put it as a cloud service, as a service, and started selling the heck out of it. <laughs> this is a stage later, now that Amazon.com has done a lot of physical activity, you know, and using AI, ML, and the robotics, et cetera. It's now the second phase of innovation, which is beyond digital transformation of back office processes, to, digit, you know, to, to the transformation of physical processes, where people are now actually delivering remotely, and it's an amazing um, area. So for back Amazon office is IT, data center kind of vibe. Yeah. You're saying front end, industrial life. Yes. Life as we know it. Right. Right, I mean I just stopped at a booth here and they have something that helps anybody who's stuck in the house who cannot move around, but with Alexa, order some water <laughs> to bring them wherever they are in the house, where they're stuck in their bed. But look at the innovation yeah. that's going on there yeah. right at the edge. So I think yeah. those are And you got really the Luna, got the sex appeal of the space. Lunar Outpost yes. interviewed those guys. They got a uh, rover on Mars. They're going to be colonizing uh, the moon. Yes. I said, I made a joke, I'm like, well, I left a part back on Earth, I'll be right back. <laughs> I can't drive back to the office. So, a lot of challenges. Andy, what's your take of the show? What's, take us your analysis, what's the, what's the vibe, what's your analysis so far? It's, it's a great show. Uh, so, as Larry was saying, one of the, one of the things was that when, when Amazon started, right? So, they were more about uh, cloud computing. So, which means is they try to uh, commoditize more of uh, data center components or compute components. So that was working really well for what I call it as a compute economy, right? Mm -hmm. And I call the newer economy as more of a AI ML based data economy. So when you move from a compute economy into a data economy, there are things that, that come into the forefront that never existed before, never popular before. Things like your AI ML model creation, model training, model movement, model inferencing, all of the above, right? And then of course the mm -hmm. robotics has come a long way since then. And then some of their, what they do at the store, auto charging, the whole nine yards. So, the whole concept of all of these components, when you put them on reinvent, such a big show, it was getting lost. So that's why, I mean, this, they didn't have it for a couple of years, they had it one year, yeah. and now all of a sudden they woke up and said, you know what, we, we got to do this, yeah. to bring out this critical components that we have, that's ripe, mature for the world to next component. So that's why, yeah. I think they are pretty good stuff, um, and some of the robotics things I saw in there, like, one of them I posted on my Twitter, it's about the robot dog sniffing out the robot rover, which I thought was pretty hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you're seeing, you're seeing like the pandemic put everything on hold mm -hmm. on the last Remars, yeah. and then the whole world was upside down, but a lot of stuff pulled forward. You saw the call center stuff booming. You saw the Zoomification of, yep. of our workplace. Um, and I think a lot of people got to the, to the realization that this hybrid steady state's here. And so, okay, that settles that. This, but the digital transformation of actually physical work, yeah. location, the walk in and out store right over here, we're seeing, that's the, that's the go store in Seattle, right. we've all been there. Um, in fact, I was, like, they was, I was kind of challenged, try to steal something, I'm like, okay, <laughs> pulling all my best New Jersey moves on everyone, you know. Yeah, you know you'll get charged you know, for it. I, 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 <laughs> I couldn't steal. get away with it. Do them, double packs, they're dropping, like, it's <laughs> smart as hell. Can't beat the system. But you bring that to where the AI, machine learning, and the robotics meet, robots. I mean, we had robots here on theCUBE, so I think this robotics piece is a huge IOT, because 
we've been covering industrial IoT for right. how many years, guys? And you can know what's going on there. Huge cyber threats, mm -hmm. um, huge challenges, old antiquated OT technology. So I see a confluence and a collision between that OT getting decimated, to your point. And so what do you, I mean, do you guys see that? I mean, am I just kind of seeing mirage? I don't see it'll get decimated, it'll get replaced right, with a new bit of <laughs> David, <laughs> David call me out on that. <laughs> decimated. <laughs> Microsoft's yeah, gonna yeah. get killed. <laughs> I think it's going to have to be reworked yeah. and and just right now you want to do anything in a shop floor, you have to have a physical wire connected to it. Now you think about 5G coming in, and without a wire, you get minute details, you get low latency, high bandwidth, and the possibilities are endless at the edge. And I think with AWS, they got Outpost, they got Snowcone. There's, thre there's a threat to them at the edge. Outpost is not doing well. Uh, you talk yeah. to anyone out there, it's like you can't find success stories. Now, yeah. I'm going to get hammered by Amazon people. Oh, what are you saying that? You know, EKS, for example, with serverless is kicking ass too. So, I mean, I'm not saying Outpost was wrong answer. Right. I mean, it was a right at the time. What, four years ago that came out? Yeah. Okay, so, but that doesn't mean it's just theirs. You got Dell Technologies wants some edge action. Yeah. So does HPE. Yes. So you got a competitive edge situation. I agree with that and I think that's definitely not Amazon's strong point, but like everything, they try to make it easy to use. Yeah. You know, you look at the AI ML and they got Canvas. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so Canvas says, hey, anybody can do AI ML. If they can do that for the physical robotic processes or even like with Outpost and Snowcone, that'll be good. I don't yeah. think they're there yet and they don't have the presence in the market yeah. like HP. Well, and let me uh, ask you guys DLS. this question because I think this brings up the next point. Will the best technology win or will the best solution win? Because if cloud's a platform and all software is open source, which you can make those assumptions, you then say, hey, they got this killer robotics thing going on with Artemis, a moonshot, they're trying to colonize the moon, but oh, they discovered a killer way to like solve a big problem. Does something fall out of this, this, this kind of Remars environment that cracks the code and radically changes and disrupts the IoT game? That's my open question. I don't know the answer, love to get your take on what's, what might be possible, what wild cards out there around disrupting the edge. So, one thing I, I see the way, so when the IoT came into the world of play, it's when you're digitizing the physical world, it's the IoT that does digitization part of that actually, right? But then it has its own set of problems. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about you know, installing sensor everywhere, right? And, and not only installing your own sensor, but also you're installing competitive sensors, so in a given square yeah. feet, how many sensors can you accommodate? So that, well, there, there are physical limitations and liabilities of bandwidth and, and network and all of that. And integration, as your well, point. right? So when that became an issue, this is where, you know, I was talking to the robotic guys here, a couple of companies, and one of the use cases they were talking about, which I thought was pretty cool, is rather than, you know, going the sensor route, you go the robot route, so if you have either, you know, a factor that you want to map out, you put as many sensors on your robot, whatever that is, and then you make it go around, map the whole thing, and then you also do a surveillance on the whole nine yards. So you can either have a fixed sensors, or you can have a moving sensors, mm -hmm. so you can have three or four robots. So initially, when I was asking them about the price of it, when they were saying about you know, $100,000, I was like, who would buy that? <laughs> when they explained that, this is the use case, Oh, that makes sense, because if you are to install you know, entire factory floor sensors, you're talking about millions of dollars. Yeah. But if you, you know, do the movable sensors in this way, it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. So it's yeah. based on your use case, what, what your use case is, the what you're trying to The general purpose achieve. is over, yeah. which you're getting yeah. at. And that's yes. the enablement, this is again, this is the cloud scale open question is, yeah. okay, the differentiations aren't gonna, isn't going to be open source software, that's no. open. It's going to be in the, how you configure it, yes. what workflows you might have, the data streams, uh, or? I think, John, you're bringing up a very good point about you know, general purpose versus special purpose. Uh, yesterday, Zooks was on the stage, and when they talked about their vehicle, it's made just for self-driving. You walk around in Vegas over here, you see a bunch of you know, old-fashioned cars, whether they're Ford or yeah. GM, and they put all these devices around it, but you're still driving the same car. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you can retrofit those, but I don't think that kind of IoT is going to work. But if you redo the whole thing, we are going to see a significant change in, in how IoT delivers value, all the way from the, you know, industrial to home to healthcare, mining, agriculture. It's going to have to redo. 
I'll go back to the OT question. There are some OT guys, you know, I know Rockwell and Siemens. Some of them are innovating faster. The ones who innovate faster to keep up with yeah. the IT side and well, well as the MLAI yeah. model are going to be the winners on that one. Yeah, I totally agree. Andy, your thoughts on, on manufacturing, you brought up the sensor thing. Robotics ultimately is, at the end of the day, an opportunity there. Obviously machine learning, we know what that does. As we move into these more autonomous builds, what does that look like? And is Amazon positioned well there? Obviously they have big manufacturers. Some are saying that they might want to get out of that business too, that Jassy's evaluating that, some are saying. So, so where does this all lead for that uh, robotics, manufacturing, you know, lifestyle, walk in, grab my food? Because it's all robotics and AI at the end of the day. I got sensors, I got cameras, I got you know, non-humans moving heavy lifting stuff. Break fix on the moon will be done by robots, not humans. So, it's all coming. What's your analysis? Well, so, <clears throat> the point about robotics is, you know, the, the, on how far it has come, it is unbelievable, right? A uh, couple of examples. One was that I was just talking to somebody and I was explaining to them, to see that robot dog over there, the Boston Dynamics one, yeah. Climbing up and down the stairs. Yeah. That's more like uh, you know the dinosaur movie opening the doors <laughs> scene. Yeah. It's like that for me because the coordinated things it is able to go walk up and down. That's unbelievable. But okay, it does that. A and then there was also another video which is going on viral on the internet. This guy kicks the dog, robot dog, and then yeah, it, yeah. it falls down and it gets back up. And the sentiment that people were feeling for the dog, <laughs> you can't, get, it's a robot, but people, it just comes Empathy to that level. For, <laughs> for a non-human, but yeah. you see but, him, hey you, but, get off my lawn. You know, it's like, it, what are, where are we? It has come to that level that mm. people are able to kind of not look at that as a robot, but it's more like a functioning, almost like a pet level, human level being. Yeah. And uh, you saw that the human-like walking robot there as well. But to an extent, in my view, we are all still in an experimentation innovation yeah. phase. It hasn't made it into the industrial terms yet. Yeah, not yet. The, the it's coming. It's coming, coming fast. Yeah. The That's what I'm trying to figure out is where you guys see uh, Amazon and the industry relative to what from the fantasy coming reality right. of space and Mars, which is, it's intoxicating, let's face it, people love this. The nerds are all here, the geeks are all here. Uh, it's, a, it's a celebration, and James Hamilton's here, trying yep. to get him on theCUBE, and this is, he's here as a civilian. Jeff Barr, same thing, I'm here not for Amazon, I, got, I bought a ticket, no you didn't <laughs> buy a ticket. I'm gonna <laughs> check on that, but he's geeking out. Yep. <laughs> they're there because they want to be here. Yeah. Not because they have to work here. Well, I mean, the thing is, the innovation velocity has increased because in the past, remember, the smaller companies couldn't innovate because they don't have the platform. Now, computers are platform available at the scale you want. AI is available at the scale. Every one of them is available at the yeah. scale you want. So if you have an idea, it's easy to innovate. The innovation velocity is high, but where I see most of the companies failing, whether a startup or a big company, is that you don't find the appropriate use case to solve, and then don't sell it to the right people to buy that. So if you don't find the right use case, or don't sell the right value proposition to the, the actual buyer, mm -hmm. then why are you here? What are you doing? <laughs> I mean, you're not just an invention, uh, like yeah. a telephone kind of thing, or, you know. So okay, you now, okay, now let's get into next talk track. I want to get your thoughts on uh, the experience here at Remars. Obviously, AWS and the Amazon people, kind of combined effort between their teams. The event team does a great job. I thought uh, the event personally was first class. Um, coffee didn't come in late today. It's a complaint, <laughs> a little complaint in the note there. Give a few interviews. But world class, high bar on the, on the quality of the event. Um, but you guys were involved in the analyst program. You've been, some, you've been through the walk through some of the briefings. Um, I couldn't do that because I'm doing the CUBE interviews. What did you guys learn? Um, what were some of the key walkaways impressions? Amazon's putting a new team together, it seems, on the analyst relations. Yeah. Um, they got their mojo booming. Yeah, they got, they got three shows now, Remars, Reinforce, Reinvent, yeah, right, right. which will be at right. theCUBE at all three. Now we got that the coverage uh, going. What's it like, what was the experience like? Did you feel it was good? Did they, where do they need to improve? What would you, how would you grade the Amazon team? I think, I think they did a great job over here in just bringing all the physical elements of the show, even on the stage, where they had robots in there. They had, it, it, it made it real, and it's not just fake stuff, and every, you know, or most of the booths out here 
are actually having high quality demos. High quality <laughs> demos. <laughs> not where you vaporware. Can see, yeah, not exactly. Not vaporware. <laughs> I won't say and the name of the, the company. <laughs> and, <laughs> and even the sessions, you know, were very good. They 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 went through details. Yeah. One thing that stood out, which is good, and I cover low code, no code, and low code, no code goes across everything. You know, you got DevOps, no low code, no code. You got AI, low code, no code. You got application development, low code, no code. What they've done with AI, with low code, no code, is very powerful with Canvas, and I think yeah. that has really grown the adoption of AI, yeah. because you don't have to go and train people what to do, and 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 then you know people are just saying, hey, let me kick the tires, let me use it. Yeah. Let me try it. It's going to be very interesting to see how Amazon, on that point, handles this, AWS handles this data tsunami. It's because of Snowflake. Snowflake's especially running the table on yeah. the old Hadoop world. I think Dave had a great analysis with some, uh, other colleagues uh, last week at Snowflake Summit. Um, but still, it's just scratching the surface. Yeah. The question is, is, how shared, that ecosystem, how will that morph? Because right now you got Databricks, you got Snowflake, and a handful of others. Teradata's got some new, new chops going on there, and a bunch of other folks. You know, some are going to win and lose in, the, in this downturn, but still, the, the scale that's needed is massive. So you got data growing so much. You know, you were talking earlier about the growth of data, and then yeah. you were talking about the growth. Of, there is a big pie, and the pie can be shared by a lot of folks. Yeah. I don't think and Snowflake pays AWS. Right. Remember that. I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. But they got very unique capabilities, just like Netflix has very unique yeah. capabilities. Yeah. They also pay AWS, yeah, yeah. right? But they're competing on Prime. So I really think the cooperation is going to be there. The, yeah. the pie is so big yeah. that there's not going to be losers, but everybody yeah. could be winners. I, I'm going to be interested in the follow up with you guys after. Next time we have an event together, we'll get you back on and, and, and figure out how do you measure these transitions? Um, you went to IDC, so they had all kinds of ways to measure shipments. Yeah. Uh, even Gardner had fumbled for years, the Magic Quadrant on IaaS and PaaS, when they had the market share, yeah. and then they finally bundled PaaS and, and AS uh, together after yeah. years of my suggesting, thank you very much, Gardner. <laughs> um, but, but that's just points with, as the landscape changes, so does the scoreboard. Yep. Right? Yes. So, you know, how do you measure who's winning and who's losing? How can we be critical of Amazon so they can get better? I mean, Andy Jassy always has said to me, and, and Adam Slussie, same way, we want to hear how bad we're doing so we can get better. So they're yeah. open-minded to feedback, I mean, not, shit posting on them, but, 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 they're, but they're open to critical feedback. What do you guys, what feedback would you give Amazon? Are they winning? Uh, I see them number one, clearly over Azure, like by miles, and even though Azure's kicking ass and taking names and getting back in the game, um, Microsoft's still behind by a long ways in some areas. Yeah, in some areas. <laughs> so so the, the scoreboard's changing, what's your thoughts on that? So, uh, look, I mean, at the end of the day, when it comes to compute, right? Amazon is a clear winner. I mean, there are others who are catching up to it, but still, they are the established leader. And it comes with its own advantages, because when you're trying to do innovation, when you're trying to do anything else, whether it's a data collection, we were talking about the data sensors, the amount of data they are collecting, whether it's uh, you know the store, the self-serving store, or, or other innovation projects, what they have going on. The, the storage compute and process of that requires yeah. a ton of compute. And they have that advantage with them. And, and as I uh, mentioned in my last article, one of my articles, when it comes to AI and ML and data programs, there is a rich and there is a poor. And the rich always gets richer because they, yeah. they have one leg up already. Yeah. You know, I mean, the amount of model training they have done, the, the billion or trillion dollar, trillion, trillion parameterization, fine tuning of the model training and everything, they could do it faster, yeah. which means they have a leg up to begin with. So unless you you are given an opportunity as a smaller mid-sized company to compete at them at the same level, yeah. you're going to start at the negative level to begin with. Yeah. You have a lot of catch up to do. So I mean, they are, and, and the other thing about Amazon is that they, when it comes to a lot of areas, they admit that they have to improve in certain areas. And they are open and willing and yeah. listen to the Where feedback. are you, let's get critical. Let's do some critical analysis. Where does my, uh, Amazon Web Service need to get better, in your opinion? What's the, what, what, what criticism would you, um, uh, in constructive way, share? I, I think on the open source side, they need to be more proactive. In, they are already, but they got to get even better than what they are. They got to engage with the community, they got to be able to talk yeah. on the open source side, hey, what are we doing? Uh, maybe on the hardware side, can they do some open sourcing of that? You know, they got Graviton, they got a lot of stuff. Will they be able to sh share the wealth? 
with other folks other than just being on an Amazon site on the edge with their partners. Got it. If they can, you know, now take that, like you said, compute with what they have with a very, um, you know, end-to-end -end solution, the full stack, and if they can extend it, that's that's going to be really, you know, beneficial for awesome. us. Andy, so, final word here. So one one area where I think they could improve, which would be a game changer, would be, you know, right now, if you look at all of their solutions, if you look at the way, you know, they suggest implementation, the innovations, everything that comes out, comes out across very techy oriented. The persona is very techy oriented. Very rarely their solutions are filled to the business audience or to the you know decision makers. So if I'm say an analyst, if I want to build a business analyst rather, if I want to build a model and then I want to deploy that or, or do some some sort of application, mobile application, what have you, it's a little bit hard. It's more techy oriented. Yeah. So if they could appeal or build a higher level abstraction of you know how to build and deploy applications for business users or even build something yeah. industry specific. This is where a lot of the legacy companies succeeded. Yeah. Go after you know, manufacturing specific or you know, education. Whatever. Well, we coined the term super cloud last reInvent and that's what we see. Uh, Jerry Chen at Greylock calls it castles in the cloud. You can create these moats yep. on top of the CapEx yep. of Amazon. Exactly. And ride their back. Yeah. And the difference in what you're paying and what you're charging, if you're good, like a Snowflake or a Mongo, yeah. I mean, Mongo's, I mean, they're just as big as, if not bigger on Amazon than Snowflake is, because um, they use a lot of compute. <laughs> no one turns off their database. <laughs> Snowflake, a little bit different, a little nuanced point, but this is the new thing. You see Goldman Sachs, you got Capital One. They're building their own kind of, I call them subclouds, but Dave Vellante yeah. says it's a super cloud, and that essentially is the model. And then once you have a super cloud, you say, yep. great, I'm going to make sure it works on Azure and Google, yep. and Alibaba if I have to. So, so we're kind of seeing a playbook, mm. but you can't get it wrong because it scales. Yeah. You can't scale yeah. the wrong yeah. answer. Yeah. So that seems to be what I'm watching is who gets it right, mm. product market fit, then if they roll it out to the cloud, yeah. then it becomes a super cloud. And that's pure product market fit. So I think that's something that I've seen some people trying uh, to figure out. And then are you a supplier to the super clouds, like a Dell, or are you become an enabler? Yeah. You know, what's Dell Technologies do? Yeah. I mean, how do the box movers compete? I, you know, you the know, whole thing is now hybrid and you're going to have to see, just you said, you said. What? Hybrid's <laughs> a steady state. I don't need a, I mean, <laughs> by the way, we have, we're box movers, we can't get the ships because Broadcom and Apple bought them all. <laughs> I mean, there's a huge chip problem going on yes, right I now. Yes, I agree, I know. agree. I mean, all, all these problems, when you abstract to a much higher level, yeah. this, a lot of these problems go away because you don't care about what they're using underlying. As long as you deliver my solution, yes. yeah, it yes, could yes, be significantly, yes. a little bit faster than what it used to be, but at the end of the day, are you solving my specific use case? Yeah. Then I'm willing to wait a little bit longer yeah. if you can. Time's on our side, and now getting the right answer is good. Larry, Andy, thanks for coming on. This great analyst session turned into more of a podcast vibe, but you know what, <laughs> it's chill here at Remars. Thanks for coming on, and uh, we unpacked a lot. Thanks for sharing. Oh, great. thanks for having Appreciate thanks it. We'll get you back us. on. We'll get you in the rotation. Keep it, we'll, make it, we'll take it virtual. Do a yes. panel, do some panels Absolutely. around this. Oh, this is not virtual, this is physical. No, we're yeah, live right yeah. now. We'll get back to, back, back to Palo Alto. You guys are influencers, thanks for coming on. You guys are moving the market, congratulations. Take a minute, quick minute each to plug any work you're doing for the people watching. Larry, what are you working on? Andy, you go after Larry, yeah, what are you so, working on? So since I started my company, Robust Cloud, since I left IDC about a year ago, I'm focused on edge computing, cloud native technologies, and low code, no code. You know, and, and basically I help companies put their business value together. Andy, what are you working on? I do a lot of uh, work on the AI ML areas. Um, particularly, I, uh, last few of my reports are in the AI ops, incident management, uh, and ML ops areas of how to generally improve your operational infrastructure. Got in it, other yeah. words, how do you use AI ML to improve your IT operations? How do you use IT ops to improve your AI ML efficiency? So those so are the real, real hardcore business transformation. Yep. All right, guys, thanks so much for coming on the analyst session. We do keynote review, breaking down Remars after day two. We got a full day tomorrow. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. See you next time. <laughs>